Really excited to be talking to you today because it, it really does feel like we're at an inflection point for green hydrogen in the U.S. Um, we've talked about it extensively on this show, but green hydrogen is seen by one group as being the silver bullet for the energy transition. You know, another sees it as a potential boondoggle where, you know, we're wasting time and, and effort on a very expensive uh, uh, opportunity that, that could even contribute negatively to the climate. And in steps the Inflation Reduction Act uh, with these rich incentives for green hydrogen manufacturing and production. Uh, but it's up to the federal government to set the rules around, uh, you know, how this is all going to work and what will qualify officially as green hydrogen. Um, so can you frame a little bit about how that process is work, working at the federal government with Treasury and the conversations that, you know, you have with uh, policymakers around making sure that we get green hydrogen right? Yeah, so the Inflation Reduction Act provides a new production tax credit for clean hydrogen. Uh, it's potentially quite lucrative or valuable, uh, worth as much as $3 per kilogram of hydrogen produced. That compares to a kind of market price for conventional or quote unquote gray hydrogen of you know, somewhere around $1.25 to $1.50 uh, per kilogram. So it's you know, worth something like uh, you know, two to even close to three times as much as the actual um, hydrogen that you're displacing. So very lucrative tax credit. But the law specifies that that full value of $3 a kilogram is only available for projects that can produce hydrogen with a life cycle or well to gate uh, greenhouse gas intensity that's about 95% cleaner than conventional methane reforming. The target is less than 0.45 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen produced. So pretty close to zero. Um, so nearly you know, fully decarbonized hydrogen. And uh, if you can do that, then you get the full $3 per kilogram. There's a couple of other tiers for um, $1.50 or $1 a dollar a kilogram uh, for lower, um, uh, for less stringent emissions intensities. But most of the projects, really all of them, I think, planning to do electrolytic hydrogen or so-called green hydrogen to produce uh, hydrogen from electricity and uh, splitting water, uh, they really need that $3 a kilogram credit to, to pencil economically. And so everybody's got their eyes on uh, what, will Treasury uh, define um, as the emissions intensity of grid-connected electrolyzers, right? The challenge here being that when you plug in directly, say, to a new wind or solar farm, you know, you know you're, you're, contrib you're uh, consuming electricity from a clean source. But if you plug into the grid, you know, all of the power that's injected into the grid is sort of commonly mingled and undifferentiated. And it's really not physically possible to say, you know, this electron produced over here is my sure. electron over here, right? And so we have various accounting mechanisms that are used for that in practice and in, in different um, for different purposes. And so Treasury now has to decide if any of those kind of current accounting practices are sufficient uh, for this new, you know, quite lucrative tax credit to make sure that clean hydrogen projects are actually clean, uh, or if we need some new rules uh, in place to define uh, what qualifies as a truly clean project. So why is this so important? And, and what's at stake in the broader conversation of you know, green hydrogen being an asset for, for the grid or the energy transition, long duration storage, whatever it is, and that we make sure that um, developers and, you know, asset owners in these large multinational companies who are always in pursuit of profit in, in addition to, you know, their climate ambitions aren't only chasing that incentive and that we make sure that this truly is a net positive. What, how could it go potentially wrong? Yeah, so there's really two considerations here. One is how do we actually make sure that clean hydrogen is clean, right? That's a statutory requirement of the law. It says you can't emit more than 0.45 kilograms if you want to get the money, right? So it was clear that Congress intended not just to subsidize, you know, any electrolyzers, right? The intent of Congress here is pretty clear. You were trying to subsidize clean hydrogen production only, at least in order to get that, that high $3 kilogram subsidy. So that's the first question. And then the second is how do we kickstart a whole new industry which today is at, you know, tens of megawatts scale. And we need to be producing, um, you know, we need, we need tens of gigawatts per year of hydrogen being, you know, of electrolyzers being deployed, you know, producing tens of millions of tons of clean hydrogen to help decarbonize the overall economy by the, say, the 2030s and 2040s. So there's sort of a technology policy goal and there's a, you know, an emissions uh, uh, and clean energy goal here. The challenge really is that the rules that are defined will shape both of those outcomes. And so one of the things that's really important about hydrogen to keep in mind is that unlike, say, an electric vehicle or a heat pump, where already, even if you're just plugging into the grid as is today, 
both of those processes are so much more efficient than a fossil fueled, you know, car or, or a boiler that they immediately start reducing greenhouse gas emissions, maybe not to zero, but they're already cleaner than the fossil alternatives. That's right. not it, the it's case. It's a conversation with, around electric vehicles that you drive your car yeah. for two and a half years. You're start, you're, you're already at that threshold of being equal to what the, the, internal combustion engine equivalent. Would yeah. Be. And that's even accounting for the, for, for the life cycle. Um, embedded battery. Yeah. Life cycle. Yeah. But even, you know, if you just think at, uh, you know, using electricity from the grid, you know, a, an EV is like three times more efficient than a, a internal combustion car of taking that electricity from your battery and moving it into, you know, motion in your car um, as opposed to the gasoline in a gas tank. And so that, that efficiency advantage means that even if you're purely fueled by a diesel generator, <laughs> an EV is better than a gasoline car on yeah. a, you know, if you vehicle miles travel basis. Same thing's true for a natural gas boiler versus a, you know, purely natural gas fired power plant run heat pump. Now that's different for hydrogen production because electrolysis is relatively inefficient, right? Mm -hmm. You lose about 30% of the energy that goes in, you know, as electricity um, in order to produce the hydrogen. And if you're running on the grid, um, you know, say an average, you know, grid mix that's sort of natural gas emissions intensity, then that actually produces as much as 20 kilograms of hydrogen per kilogram, or sorry, 20 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen. That's about twice as bad as conventional methane reforming, just from the typical uh, grid mix today. And so we actually really need to be careful that not only do we meet the very low near zero emissions thresholds here, but that if we set these rules in a lax way, we could actually see increased emissions from hydrogen production. And that would really be a shame, meaning that we're producing more CO2 from electricity generation than the emissions from you know, fossil hydrogen production that we're displacing. Um, so the key question here is, you know, can we just use traditional renewable energy credits that are used for, say, compliance with renewable portfolio standards at the state level or have sometimes been used by corporate, you know, voluntary buyers to, to show that they're, you know, renewable powered? Can you just buy grid power, staple a renewable electricity credit on and call it clean, right? That's sort of been the conventional practice in the sort of voluntary Net zero. Uh, reporting, you know, uh, type markets. But this is a different context, right? This isn't just some ESG document. This is billions of dollars of taxpayer subsidies at stake, trying to meet a very clearly defined um, statutory goal of near zero emissions. And what we've shown in peer reviewed research um, in my group, published in environmental research letters uh, last fall, is that unless we're actually matching consumption of electricity with new clean production at the same time that you're consuming it and in the same general location, right, that's deliverable to the location of the consumer, that you can actually get significant grid-related emissions that could be, uh, you know, between 10 and 40 kilograms of hydrogen, of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen. So just as bad to four times as bad as um, methane reforming. And so this comes down to a debate about what typically around hourly matching versus annual matching, right? It's the way the, the term of art, you know, do you, can you kind of net out your consumption annually? You know, so as long as I produce enough clean, clean energy at some time of the year to equal the amount of clean energy I can, or the energy I consume, I can call that, you know, good enough. Or do you actually need to be consuming electricity at the same time that it's being produced? And what our research shows is very clearly that you actually have to be doing the latter. You have to be producing new clean electricity at the time you're consuming it, or the kind of imbalance between when you're producing and when you're consuming um, leads to significant uh, amounts of fossil power generation that actually goes to supply uh, the electrolyzers, and that drives emissions uh, way above the threshold that's required by the law.